I'm Mark Boris and this is Straight Talk. Welcome to Straight Talk, mate. Thanks for having me, Mark. Please welcome the lovely Gary Banner, everybody. Shall we? You're in the hot seat. I, I can feel it. One thing that comes straight to my mind is Chopper. The league was amazing. How do you get yourself into that role? <laughs> when I read something or someone approaches me for a job, I know straight away, instinctively, whether I feel as though I can become that person. If I don't get that response, I'm out. With Chopper, I, for some reason, just immediately felt like I could become him. That's my favourite part of the job, is going away and learning and doing the research so that then when I walk on set, I'm prepared. Do you have an AFL team? Me? Collingwood, yeah. sorry. I know, I know, I know, I know, but it doesn't matter. Only because I'm mate of Eddie's and I've been mates with Eddie's for years. But for you, I'm happy to make changes. Mark. Eric Banner, welcome to Straight Talk, mate. Thanks for having me, Mark. You're in the hot seat. <laughs> I, I can feel it. <laughs> You're actually doing a lot of promo at the moment for the new, the second series of Dry. Yeah. How's that been? Uh, it's been received really well so far. So, um, yeah, we're, we're excited and we're excited to take it out to the public. You know, we were meant to release the film back in August, as you know, but because of the strike, we held on to it because we couldn't do any of this sort of stuff. Uh, and we think it's really important because Australian films need the leg up. You know, it's a um, competitive marketplace and you can't just put a film out there and hope it does well. Is it unusual for the lead actor to be on the hustings, like out there prom promoing and pushing, is that unusual or is that, or would that happen in the US? Because I wouldn't have any idea. Yeah, I mean, it is, we're kind of contractually, um, you know, uh, have to do some press when we, when we do films, but it, then it depends on how involved you are with the project. I'm a producer on, on these films, so I'm obviously highly motivated to, to get the best possible result for the film. And I love the, love the films and the people I'm working with. So for me, especially with a film like this, to give it its best chance, you, you, you're going the extra mile for sure. So it's important for you, I guess, is what you're saying. Like you, you're you putting that sort of Aussie shoulder behind the wheel type deal, you know, stuff being a superstar, I'm going to make it work. Yeah, and I think the Australian public's different. Our media landscape's a bit different. Like when I promote films in America, I remember the first few times I went on big junkets, I'd say to my publicist, where's the radio? And she's like, what do you mean? I said, where's all the radio? She's like, are you prepared to do radio? I said, yeah, isn't radio huge? Because, you know, that culture in Australia, like, radio is massive. If you yeah. don't do radio in Australia, you, you, your product would be dead pretty much if you just relied on television. So the markets are a little bit a little bit different. But, um, yeah, I, I enjoy it. I, I enjoy it when, I'm, when I get the energy up for it. I don't do it that often, so I, I, can, I can, you know, put my mind to it when the time comes. Do you mind if I just uh, quickly sort of scratch around Eric Benner a little bit? Yeah. Where were you born? I was born in... In Melbourne, yep, in a place called Malvern. Uh, my mum was a hairdresser, so I grew up in the back of a hairdressing salon for the first few years of my life, and then we moved to Tullamarine. And I pretty much spent my childhood in 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 Tulla, out near the airport. And are both your folks from Croatia? Uh, dad's from Croatia, mum's from Germany. So your actual surname is not Banner. It's yeah, it's else. Banadinovic. Ben yeah, still Banadinovic. Today. A lot of Aussies make it Banadinovic. I don't know why, but there's an I in there. It's Banadinovic. I mean, I look at it structurally, you look like someone from Croatia because like Croatians, I think uh, Serbians are uh, like on average are the, and Croatians, similar sort of backgrounds, are the tallest men in the world uh, on really? average. Yeah, okay. Um, and you're a tall guy. You've got that sort of build. Um, how often does do the uh, people who are casting for movies and shows that you might go in, how often do they look at your physique and actually cast you around your physique and your, and your jawline, your face, the whole look? Well, I'll never know. I never ask the question. Um, I think I've been, I've been quite lucky that, that my look can kind of go both ways. You know, like if you look at some of the films that I've, I've been in, I've been able to go sort of European and I've been able to go non-European. So um, I never overthought it, to be honest, but there, there's a certain physicality you can't get away from, you know. So there's always going to be a bent, you know, in terms of the stuff that you're offered. It would be very easy for me to have done nothing but very, very physical films, which doesn't interest me. So you have to work consciously to not not play against that, but to just kind of temper temper that. Yeah, because, I mean, I, 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 one thing that comes straight to my mind is Chopper. Um you put a lot of weight on for, for relatively speaking yeah. in terms of how you're sitting here today, but you put a lot of weight on for Chopper. 
probably a lot younger too, or you were younger. Yeah. Um, my God, you looked exactly like him though. <laughs> Thanks, mate. <laughs> I'm yeah, serious. Yeah, yeah. And and you actually came across like him too. Yeah. Like it was amazing. How is that? I, I don't know anything about acting, but is that called method acting? What is that? How, how, did you spend time with the dude to find out how he was? I, I don't know. I, I don't like to put the label method acting on it because then I'd, I'd find out that, you know, it's not method acting or it is. So I just go with what works for me. Um, and what works for me, first of all, is having a lot of time to prep. Like you can't call me and say, we're filming next month. I'm going to pass on that project. Like I need things to marinate up here for as long as possible. Secondly, I have to respond immediately. Like when I read something or someone approaches me for a job, I know straight away instinctively whether I feel as though I can become that person. And if it's if it's a no, it's a no. It doesn't matter what the project is, who's in it, who's directing it, how much it is. If I don't get that response, I'm out. With Chopper, I for some reason just immediately felt like I could become him even before I'd started doing any research. And there wasn't a lot of material on him available at the time, but I'd seen a couple of interviews. So it was just a lot of research, mate. And and we we were ready, to, we were getting close to start filming. We were in, in early stages of pre-production. The film got postponed because of the Al McFeast interview years ago when Chopper went on air slightly drunk and told stories. So I had, that worked in my favour because it meant it gave me about another 12 months to prepare. So it was a combination of things, reading everything I, cu I could, watching everything I could, spending time with him. Um, Andrew, the director, and I went down to Tassie and hung out with him for a few days. Um, and, and then trying to come up with a version in my head that, that would work on screen because, you know, doing an impersonation is not enough. Like it has to be believable, it has to be something else. So a lot of it's just up here and I can't explain everything that goes on up there. Impersonations... It, it, it's you're right. It's not enough. Otherwise, it probably doesn't come across quite good enough. Like in terms of excellence, in, impersonation is quite, it's quite interesting. In that, uh, when I was reading somewhere that when you're a kid, a little kid, you did impersonations, whether or not it's true or not, I don't know. But like just to get laugh, perhaps, or maybe get an audience. Like uh, impersonation is that something you know you you're good at? Like in terms of impersonations, like. Um, uh, how you physically stand, how you speak, the lang the sound of your language, the accent in your language, you know, the intonations and all that sort of stuff. Is that something that you you, you love doing? You've always yeah, loved doing? Yeah, it's something that comes naturally. And my son has it as well, which is really funny to to see that being passed down. It's just, it's not something I've taught him. It's just in him, like straight away. Um, so I did it as a kid. I probably use it to get out of trouble mainly, you know, to get in trouble at school and then get out of trouble at school. I occasionally would have teachers come up to me on the slide and say, hey, could you do, I think you do a good Mr. So-and-so. Could you, could you do it for me? Serious? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, I love that. Um, and my grandfather uh, was very encouraging of it. And then I grew up, you know, watching a lot of TV as a kid and watching a lot of American shows and British shows and just trying to do the different accents and stuff. So it was something I was doing without really being overly conscious of, without knowing that it was, you know, kind of good training for, for the future. So when you, given that you know, that's something you, that's a skill you have, it's a thing you enjoy, it's something you grew up doing, when you've got to go and play a, a role like Hector, for example, in Troy, which by the way, I've I, I I'm always been upset that Hector gets nailed. Yeah, me too. Um, but seriously, like he's <laughs> like a fucking superhero, like, you know, like he's the best fighter for Troy's God <laughs> and he gets nailed unfairly, I thought, I thought anyway. <laughs> but when you go to take that role on, does – do you then sort of put yourself into the mindset of someone like uh, that, how you would interpret how Hector is or was? Because obviously you don't see Chopper. Chopper's alive, he's around. Hector's been gone for a long, long time. How do you get yourself into that role? Like how do you start to think, how am I going to impersonate what the audience would think Hector is like? Or are you saying, I'm going to take to the audience who I think Hector's like? Yeah, it's a combination of everything. So, you know, talk with the director, go to the source material, look at the script, and then for Hector, it was really just, just primarily for me about just pure leadership, like leadership, like a man leading an army, and and the army loving him, you know, being being the ultimate, you know, type A warrior who had a heart as well. He just seemed when I read the script, I thought there's something about him. It's not just type A, you know, rah rah rah, um, and so I, I read all kinds of like I remember reading an Evander Holyfield book preparing for that, like a book on Romulus, um, all kinds of different things just to try and get 
different perspectives on on leadership and battle and and then you know going to that place and you had again I had a really good amount of time to prepare for that for that film Wolfgang Peterson our director cast quite early Brad was on board first and then and then it was myself and so I had a good amount of time to to prepare which I needed a lot of horse riding a lot of fighting um and are you then, doing that yeah yeah you had to learn how to how to bear back and all that sort of stuff so I mean, and it's just the best part of the job, which is going back to before, like if you said to me, the film starts next month, are you on? One of the reasons I say no is because to me, for someone who didn't study tertiary education, one of the highlights is that I get to go to school almost every time I get a, I get a job, you know, and that's, that's my kind of favourite part of the job is going away and learning and, and doing the research so that then when I walk on set, I feel like I'm prepared and I don't want to rush that. Because that's that's the gift, and if, if if you don't have that period of time, you can feel underdone or paranoid or whatever. You know? And that'll come across, I guess. Yeah, because at the end of the day, even if you don't like the film, here's the most important thing for me: um, what matters is that I believe in what I'm doing. Because if I don't, I can't expect you to buy that for a second, and and you won't buy that for a second. You'll see through that. So if I can just feel it myself. And at least make what I'm doing convincing. I can't control a lot of the other elements, but I can at least hope that whilst I'm on screen, you at least believe what I'm doing. Um, that's what's really important to me. That's interesting because I have I have actually read some reviews of other movies you've been in, and sometimes they might not have done as brilliantly as everybody expected them to relative to costs and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. I'm talking financially. But a lot of the reviewers said, but Banner did blah, blah, blah. In other words, you shone in terms of your role. And what's really interesting, you just talked about leadership. I'm just wondering to myself, is acting out a role, for example, Hector or even Chopper for that matter, is acting out a role for, say, someone like yourself, is it about finding that one virtue or those two virtues in the case of Hector, leadership? How can I express, how can you express that particular virtue because virtue is what stick to us. I mean, I right. love seeing a virtue in somebody or yeah. something like actually overextended nearly, like glaringly. Yeah, yeah. But I, and maybe when I, now I'm thinking about Hector yeah. and I never thought about it at the time, but that's what stuck to me. Now you've explained it to me. Do you actually go looking for the virtue and then try and express it really strongly? And we will talk about how you've done it in dry because mm. there's virtues coming out of that as well. But just on Hector, is that something it's, you look for? It's got to be in the source material. It's hard to just construct it out of out of thin air. It has to be there on the page. Um, but then you're trying to add to it, and then you're trying to work out a way of of um, tapping into what's there and amplifying it, or you know, coming up with a different version of it. A lot of it comes from conversations with the director, and you hope you're on on the same page. And um, and then just. I think a lot of it's instinctual. I probably don't overthink it, to be honest. Um, and then, you know, you've got to get there on the day and have a play and try different things and some things will work and some things won't and you just got to experiment. Maybe they're just natural virtues for you. I mean, you maybe if you don't overthink it. So if you're not specifically looking for it, perhaps maybe, and I'm just putting it to you, mm. perhaps these are just natural instincts for you. I mean, maybe you saw a lot of leadership in your life. It could have been your dad. It could have been anybody, school teacher, whatever. Um, do you think that virtues are important to you? you know, all the usually like leadership, strength of character, you know, respect, blah, 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 all those sorts yeah. of things. A lot of these come out in, in your character, by the way, Aaron. He's a, he has a lot of these virtues. Yeah. Are they natural things for you, do you think, today, if, if we just talk about that for a second? I'm oh, definitely mindful of them, 100%, you know, as a, as a, as a parent. And um, I love them and I love those virtues in, in my sporting heroes as well. It's not just enough for them to be really really good at what they do i'm looking for something else in not them. just skilled not just skilled yeah i'm looking for something else that enables them to carry the team you know and lead by example and just have that little x factor that's a little bit different to the guy that's just being able to do whatever they can do so yeah maybe um maybe a bit of it comes from my dad or you know other people that i that I've you know noticed as I was as I was growing up, or so so I guess subconsciously there's probably a connection b between you know that ideal and some of the some of the characters. I have played some really awful characters too. Like I've played, <laughs> I played some absolute shockers who who don't really have the that side to them, and that that comes quite easily as well, uh, which is a bit scary. But 
Um, so it's not always the case, but I, I guess there is a bit of a connection. Because I, mean, I don't want to go back to Chopper again, but like Chopper's, you know, some people would consider him to be, uh, you know, uh, not a nice person. But what's interesting about the way you play him, you made him likable. He's funny. There's no getting around that. Like, you can't hide from that. Um, and it's what made the film quite controversial at the time, you know, because people were uncomfortable with people laughing in the cinema at moments when they just, you know, technically shouldn't. Yeah, he's holding a gun at someone or he's getting stabbed or whatever. I mean, but that like was it. him. Like, the, that that was the easiest part to play because he was one of the funniest people you'd ever come across. And, and in terms of reading a room, mate, forget it. In terms of, like distilling a character in three seconds to this day i've never met anyone who could look at a you know bunch of people and just have their measure within seconds you know know exactly what you're thinking know how to manipulate you mentally like just unbelievable so so that's there so you just try and work out well how do i god how do i capture that i remember being so exhausted after i spent a couple of days with him and i was like how do i capture that how do i how do i capture that energy sucking persona of someone you know so again it has to be on the page you know if you don't have the words to do that if you don't have the freedom to try and exude that you're 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 limited what do you mean on the page how do you mean so you can have all the intentions in the world but if if the script doesn't have the the basic elements of of a good story um if there are holes in the scene if there are things that don't work they don't work and you, you can't fix them on the day, usually. I like to have a crack at it if a scene's not working on the day to say, hey, this is a bit long or this is a bit boring or this just doesn't work. Um, and that, that comes with, with time, also comes from a stand-up background because when you're on stage, if your material's shit, guess what? You know about it really quickly and you better fix it before the next gig, you know? Um, so you need that rigor sometimes in filmmaking as well because I don't want to come back in six months and reshoot this scene. You know, yeah, it's just more of a practical outcome. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I can be a bit a bit pragmatic in that in that sense. Um, but yeah, it has to be it has to be right on the page. And so so the script you hope is is the best it can possibly be before you arrive, because you know there's not a whole lot of time to to be meddling with that stuff once you're up and running. So what, what I just want to talk about the first uh, uh, of the series, and I'm I'm actually giving it longevity already. Um, but we will go back to the first dry, uh, yeah. the fir very first show um and i want to ask you and I, I don't know how this works but it says you're a producer or a co-producer yep. what does that actually mean i mean you actually telling people how you want the scene to look or what does it mean so it means rather than just turn up as an actor and and do the job you're involved in in every element so you're involved in helping putting the financing together having meetings about all that sort of stuff you're involved in making decisions on heads of production who who's going to be your cinematographer who's going to be in all those different departments. You're having conversations with the director about that. Casting? Casting, who who, who are we going to cast? Location scouting, where are we going to shoot? I mean, just everything. Putting the campaign together, delivering on the campaign. I mean, just every step of the way. And I only do it when I can really deliver on, on those fronts. So there are some actors who like to attach themselves Action. to projects and then not have the time to do all that sort of stuff. So I'll only do it usually when I'm involved in the project as an actor as well. Um, because then I've, I've got, I've got more, more say in how things are run and I can have more of an influence in, in that regard and also makes a su potential success of something a lot more fun. So Robert Connolly, our director is, he's a business partner of mine. We share an office together. So when things go well, it's, it's a lot more fun. It's a really lonely business, acting, directing, producing, very, very lonely. You know, you're not in an, in an office normally full of people until you go and work on a film. Aside from that, you're on your own, usually at home or in your lounge room. So Robert and I paired up together about 15 years ago and got an office together and we just kind of like lean on each other. We don't have a formal structure. We never said, hey, we're going to make these things together. We met whilst working on a film, Romulus, my father, and we just went, I think you're a good bloke. Let's share an office together, you know, and just share all the good and bad, you know, and no pressure to work together, by the way. No pressure whatsoever. You go to your thing, I'll do my thing. Let's share a sync and see what happens, you know. And um, and then we end up, we've done four or five films together now, still with no formal structure. He seems to me, like I, I've done a little bit of research on him, but he seems to me someone who's um, 
really passionate about the Australian scene. He is. Extraordinarily yeah. passionate about Australian scene, nearly, nearly exclusive, exclusively so, and which I like. Um, and I saw you both interviewed together. It was like uh, you looked at him for an answer, he looked at you for an answer. Like it was like, and you knew when to talk and he knew when to talk and you knew, knew when to add. Uh, it was like you were so close, ridiculously close in terms of what you do. Yeah. When he approached you for dry one, dry the first of the dry series, um, did you and he sit down and not only collaborate but sort of imagine what this is going to look like? You know, like imagine where you're going to film this. Imagine like that last scene in in the in dry that like where you're in the um, in the forest. You called it a forest. He's gone into the forest, and uh, it's a, but it's a dry forest. It looked like it'd, it'd yeah. light up in a second, which actually yeah. was sort of part of the part of the, the scene. But but it was like it was unbelievably Australian to me. Yeah. And I and I have a farm. I know exactly what that looks like. Yeah. When I go through a dry spell, and I thought, wow, it was like it was sort of it was super dramatic for me. Do you and he just sit down and actually imagine these things and say, let's go and go find the location yeah, together? Literally, yeah. Let's jump in the car and keep keep going till we find the right the right place to to film and. Um, yeah, I'd read the book. He'd read the book, and then Bruno Papandreou, who's an old friend of of Rob's, was, was had the um, the rights to the material, and called Rob up and said, "How do you feel about directing the film?" And he got off, literally got off the phone. I was ten meters away from him in the office, and he goes, "Just got off the phone from Bruno. They've they've got the rights to the dry." And I said, "Oh, I just read that book. It's a cracker." And we just both looked at each other and just went, "Oh, maybe we should do it together," you know. And that was it. It was simple as that. Wow. And then we both got on the phone to Bruno and said, let's let's all team up together. Um, and then it was just like an avalanche, you know, Roadshow got on board and um, we just we just went cracking. But yeah, no, it is. We we get really excited about the practical side of filmmaking and Rob's a really tough guy, physically tough. How, how do you mean? In terms of what he can endure on set. Like he has amazing endurance. What he what he goes through when he makes a film and and the hours that he puts in and what he can withstand physically. I mean, on on Force of Nature, we filmed in the middle of winter in a rainforest in the rain. That's what we needed. And he was in a really low rent jacket the whole time. It wasn't waterproof, and he was like a drowned bloody rat every day on set, freezing cold, wet hair, wet down jacket. And I'm looking, I'm thinking. Just get a decent waterproof jacket, would you, mate? You a dry as a bone. <laughs> Something, you know, but he's just so focused and, and has so much energy. And we filmed Blue back in Western Australia out on the water, um, the dry out in the Mallee, the Wimmera, you know, stinking hot. He's just – directors can be like that, actually. They can – you can you can end up meeting some of the physically toughest people, the most unassuming, but when, when they get a focus, it's just like – they can withstand anything. Is it obsession? Yes, it is obsession. You have to be obsessed to be a director. It's a it's a different cat. It's what about a, as an actor though? Do you become obsessed with the character? Yes, you have to. Does yeah. do, does how much of Aaron? How much of of you is in Aaron? I wouldn't have a clue. I don't like to think about those things because it's not my job to put myself in my characters. It's my job to work out how to become how to become them. You, you won't be able to control how an audience responds to them thinking how much of you is that person or not, you know. So you can't really think about those things. You're just really trying to work out how do I become this person? And they're usually always smarter than me, so it's always fun. And um, try and work out how will they talk, how will they walk, how will they react. I, I think 99% of, of acting really is just pure psychology. Like it, it really is. It's You're the psychologist, like, psychologist, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. And it's really about how would this person respond to what's just been said? Now, I can't write the words for them. They're usually there already on the script. But technically anyone can say those words. Anyone. I can give that script to you and say, Mark, action, go. It's about understanding how, what are the five or 10 different ways that I can respond to what was just, just said? I'm trying to imagine who that person is. It's not how I would respond, it's how they would respond. So it really is just about psychology and that's why you have to spend most of your life observing people, taking notes, you know, listening, not talking, just working out 
what to put in the memory bank <laughs> for for in the future. Is that what you do? You, do you take yeah. notes? Yeah. Well, I don't. Not not with a mental notes. Yeah, just men, mental notes. Absolutely. Yeah, I can't. I can't switch off that observational thing. So crowded rooms are hard work. You know, I don't do a lot of them. Um, you know, I like I like observing observing people. It's interesting because you just said you can't try and do what the audience thinks this is Eric Banner being part of Aaron Aaron Falk. So, but it's interesting when I watched the movie, I thought I, I bet you, I reckon Eric's like that. <laughs> that that's and that's the romantic. Have you never met me? No, you but I haven't met you, correct? Yeah, and yeah. that's how audiences romanticize. Perhaps um, I don't know how often you yeah. think as an audience, but. If I'm just thinking as a survey one, I'm thinking to myself, I reckon he's a bit like that anyway. <laughs> and then I went and watched it Hector. I reckon he's a bit like that anyway. And, and uh, what was the name of the series you did? You play that uh, weird guy in oh, America. Dirty John. Oh, my God. I, 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 no, 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 no. I, did, I didn't want to think you were like that that dude. In fact, like it was too out there for me. But but uh, lucky it was based on a true story. And um, and I thought it was, this, is proper, this is proper acting. But, but when I watched... Um, drop the dryer. I mean, I actually thought I'm hoping that mm. some of those personality traits are your actual personality traits, and that's probably audiences romanticizing about a movie. And that's what I don't know. That's what I do when I go to the movies. I sort of it's a it's an escape for me, mm. and it's r romanticization of of the situation, like you know, a who done it, a little bit of a hero, a villain. The, who is the villain? Um, you know, as I said, the who done it part of it. Like, can this dude work all this shit out? Is he going to work out the the answer for me? And I mean, in the first in the first uh, of the series of Dry, you actually you kept wrong footing me. But towards the end, I started getting a few, started narrowing down the outcomes. And did you get it in the end? I did. I, 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 did, did, I, really? did, I did. I mean, because I, I got I'm a bit. I, I tell you what gave me away, or gave it away, gave it to me was the um, his wife. When she when uh, she got cut off by him, she was about to tell you something, about to tell Aaron something, about um, why she's so scared about her home, and yes. that that and and he come walking in and he cut he cut her off, and I thought, oh, what's that about? Like there's something going on here between these two. Yeah. And uh, but you did throw me off a few times. You managed to, well, you know, the story managed to throw me off a few times, particularly when uh, what was his name Gretchen? Is it Gretchen? Yes. Well, when you showed me the color of the bullets, my God, I got sucked into that. I thought. Hang on, what's going on here? And then when she had the kid to uh, whatever oh, his name how was, good was that? Yeah, yeah. yeah Jane Harper's great at misdirection. Yeah, really a lot of fun um, when you're making the film, trying to calibrate that right because it's all about shifting the focus onto another character. Yeah, not too much so. Not too it, much though, yeah. and then sometimes deliberately so. So then the audience thinks, well, it can't be that person it's because too it's obvious. too obvious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, fucked me up. They're like, oh, I'm sort of sitting there, oh, my God. Like, and because, uh, I, I, you know, I love to try and work out a problem. I, I mean, it's, it's like like problem solving for, for me. I, I just love to know how that works though. Like when you're, you're a producer, co-producer, when you're sitting there and this gets presented from the, the, the person who wrote the book or you're looking at the book and, you know, the yeah. storyline, do you guys all sit down and say, uh, "This is how we're going to um, play that part"? You know, let's make it obvious or make it not make it obvious. Let's we're going to sort of not manipulate the audience, but play with the audience a bit. Yeah, for sure. And then you know, you've got the benefit of the edit, where yeah. things really come come together, and that's when you can really start to manipulate and calibrate even performances to a certain degree. You know, we'll go with this take instead of that take because we we want to tone that down. We want to amplify the villainous nature of that person or whatever. And and watching Rob and the editor through that process. And that's very rigorous. That takes us a long time. And we end up with a lot of different versions of, of the film and it's quite long and then it gets shorter and you think, oh, you've cut too much out. Let's do this and let's do that. And in comes the music. So that's that's an amazing, amazing um, part of the filmmaking is the edit. And that's where a lot of the, you know, shifting in focus can be played around with or the timelines can be exaggerated or increased or decreased you know you can go linear non-linear um there's almost too too much choice too much choice when you get into into an edit suite the cutting room the edit is probably one of the unsung heroes of a good movie 100 percent um genius because there's so many versions you get a job adopt you know yeah. and you've got to cut it down to what, an hour and a half or whatever it is and yeah you, like let's just give me one how much film would you actually do like Hundreds of hours, hundreds and hundreds of hours, or what were we looking at? Probably Which, not. Probably not hundreds. At, um, a two-hour film, there'd be at least 
oh, they'd have to be at least 10 or 15 hours or maybe 20, depending on how many takes. But I can tell you this, the first cut is never great. It's never great. If you showed people the first cut of a film, you try to release it. Not, not going to the movies. Not, not going to the movies. <laughs> we're, not, we're not there yet, you know. So it is, it, is a, it, is a, it is an art form and I take my hat off to editors. They do beautiful work and they do it in a way that you just, sometimes between the third cut and the fourth cut, there'll be tiny changes and it will feel like a completely different film and you can't even put your finger on it. If it wasn't your note and you didn't see what, what the notes were and you watch it, you're like, what did you bastards just change? What did you change? Because it just feels different. And so until they tell you, you go, oh, okay, okay. It's just little trims here and there can make all the difference. It's like imagine you go and see a stand-up comedian and you change their timing even slightly, you remove a few jokes. It's a completely different show. And expressions. Expressions, intonations. So that's what an editor has the ability to do and a great editor. It's just, and that's why a lot of great filmmakers form a partnership with cinematographers or editors and they just keep working together because they have a shorthand or they just think this guy gets my work. You know, there's it's, it's a workflow there. In the collaboration with you said I, I do want to talk about cinematography. Um, in the in the in the in the first of the series of, of the of the dry series, um, how important was in terms of your collaboration with Rob Connolly? Um, how important was the cine, cinematography relative to showcasing Australia? Yeah, was that an issue? Was that something in your mind? Let's oh, get no, this we, out there. Yeah, no, we we really our responsibility is to look. When someone reads a book, they're their greatest director. They have already directed the film in their head, and in some ways, you can't beat that because it's their version of what they've read. Our job is to take the book, interpret it, adapt it, and go. What's the greatest cinematic version we can possibly do of this? What's the and so Rob's always thinking large scale, large scale. We're trying to get people to go to the cinema to watch our films. We don't want them to sit around and wait for them to pop up on, you know, um, free to air or Netflix or wherever it's going to end up down down the pipeline. We want them to go to the cinema, and we're making conscious decisions in terms of equipment and how we shoot, the sound, everything, so that you go and see these films in the cinema. So. Yeah, your cinematographer, your style of filming, what lenses you're using, your locate. I mean, it's hugely important, hugely important. And then the the offshoot of that is people from overseas. So you go, well, this is a bit different. Yeah. I haven't been to that place before. And for the dry, we were really determined that it was it was the Australia that you and I know in, intimately. It's not tumbleweeds out in the desert, the kind of caricature Australia. It's the Australia that we go, yeah, that's an Australian country town. Yeah, it was interesting you said that because I kept looking at the silos and I kept thinking to myself and, and a few of the scenes where there was fields, I was trying to work out was it wheat or what what it was. Yeah, it was wheat. wheat. Fields, yeah. And I was trying to work out was it so dry that the wheat was no good. And I was, you know, you, you had a number of scenes where you could see the silos in the background, which to me is like very much r regional Australia, yeah. um, and I'm, I kept thinking to myself, "What if they're full?" Um, what? And then when it, it's called the dry, you know, I, I don't want to sound weird, but twice I put on pause and I got them how to drink of water. I actually felt, I felt <laughs> dryness from the whole yeah, damn yeah. thing. I, I actually got that feeling. Yeah, like no water. Well, that dry riverbed that you see at the end of the film, I, I, I remember that being such a striking image when we found that location. Like. People are going to think this is fake. I mean, it looks like water has not touched this surface for, for the last 30 years. That was real. So we filmed the dry just before the drought broke, 2018, like pre-COVID. And then after we filmed, we, we went the we other bought, way. We bought the rains. And, yeah, no, totally. And they had a great season, but but you could you could feel it out there, the Mallee, the Wimmera. Like you could feel the tension when we were filming out there, that what, what the drought had done to those areas. Some of the towns we were in had no drinking water. A couple of times a week, a truck would come in, and they would the, the locals would turn up and fill up all their containers and bottles, and off they off they go. So, yeah, it, it's it it's it's just ingrained in the in the cinematography is that dryness. I actually found a a, a deep beauty, irrespective of the fact that it looked like it was drought ridden, which it was late that during that period. I mean, the rains came about twenty. But we, you know, we had the mad bushfires up in around 19. Um, and I mean, being a farmer, I know what it was like. I mean, my property was totally dry. Had, you know, everything was turned brown in my joint. But I found a great beauty, especially when there was one scene where 
you were walking in the creek that was dry. Yeah. Just the difference between your height and and I, I kept looking how high the water must have been yes. when it was thought. I, Back in I the thought, day, what yeah. the hell? Yeah. Where's the water gone? Yeah. And how could it be so it, it gorged a big hole out of the joint? And you're and just the relativity. And I thought there's a great beauty, and I don't know whether anyone else around the world is going to think that either. But and I, then I started thinking, well, people in the city, there'd be a lot of people in the city, Eric, who've never seen that mm -hmm. today. A lot of people in the city come from another country, living here. They might be living out in the west of Sydney, who would never have seen that. Yeah. I mean, there's actually a lot of Australians who never see that. I mean, you yeah. and I are a bit more lucky than that, but a yeah. lot of us, especially younger people, would never have seen that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And we do it as well in, in Force of Nature. So it's a completely different landscape. It's it's this incredible subtropical, a um, lot of ferns, just in, incredibly lush bush. Again, completely different to how foreigners would, would picture Australian bush. It's not... It's not scrubby. It's not just simply eucalyptus. It's ferns and lots. Like it's just it's, it's like rainforesty. Rainforesty. It's just stuff everywhere. Leeches. They're just just wet. Really. Oh, you got really, leeches in it. Oh god. We got, You've got to have leeches. Thousands. That's Australian. Uh, we ha in real life we had leeches. We had to keep them off the bloody camera. Serious? But, oh yeah. That's yeah. cool. I think they are cool, mate. No, I no, I, I mean I've that. I've got a lot I'm... of respect for them. Heat seeking. You know, like drop down out of the tree inject you with something so you don't know they're there, suck your blood, and then off they go. But like, they seal it up, seal you, seal you off seal before they go. Yeah. That's why you can't pull them off because if you don't, you'll keep bleeding. You've got to let right. them either, you know, seal you off or burn them off or, or yeah. I don't know, some other old Australians, they put solder on them. Sol and light. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, Amazing. I, that's very Australian. Yeah. You now, the, the crew were, were leached every single day, every single day. The leeches, by the way, were having the best time of their lives. Well fed. They're like, we've never seen anyone in here. There were all these people, they, you know, they were just they feeding off us like crazy. So Force of Nature, yeah. the drive, this, the second of the series, uh, to, just tell me exactly where that was filmed. Yeah, so we filmed in the Dandenong Ranges, Latrobe Valley, the Otways. Again, like with the dry, we went to three or four different locations to stitch together the look that we were after. We wanted the audience to feel this is basic premise that every Australian will relate to. Five women go on a corporate retreat, bushwalking and get lost. Right, and you s that premise immediately every Australian thinks of themselves and which one of those five women would I be? What sort of, what, how would my personality do out in the bush? So you, have you cast the five characters as five different types? Yes, yeah, so Jane Harper did a great job of writing five really distinct characters within those five. You know, sometimes you read a book when there's a lot of characters, you, you, you've you got to go back 10 pages because you get confused with all the names. They're so distinctive and so... So that was that was a challenge. Find five actors that could portray five distinctly different characters in in that scenario. And we started with Deborah Lee Finesse. Once once that name was suggested, she's a very old friend of mine. I thought, oh, will she do it? This would be she'd be perfect, perfect as the corporate leader, city woman, polished. Suddenly she's dumped into the forest, and she still has to be the leader amongst these these women. Um, so that's a, the, the basic premise. One of these five women is my informant, and she goes missing within the five. You being still in the AFP? Yes. She's your informant? She's my informant. But, but, but outside of this five gr a group of five or, or an informant just in general life for you? I'm trying to bring down the company that right. she's working for. They're doing some dodgy things financially. She's my, she's my inner informant, and the five women go missing, and then one of them, my informant, goes missing within that. And so that's why I that's why I'm involved. That's why you get called in. That's why I get called in. Okay. Who's calling you in this time? So she places a phone call before they go out of phone range. Yeah. A slightly distressing voicemail. She tries to get in contact with me and I know something's something's up. And so my partner and I have to go out and join the search party and kind of blow our cover a little bit and and people realise why why are the feds here? What what the hell's it got to do with them? So so there's a little bit of subterfuge there, but in the in the end, I, I, Aaron feels a great sense of responsibility for his informant. So it's, it's quite interesting. It goes into the morals of you know how far do you push someone, and you know how much danger do you put them in in these in these sort of situations. Informants, obviously, it's a very very interesting subject, a very interesting um, line of work for police to to have informants and how much 
information can they get from them and what sort of danger are they in when they're, when they're, when they're doing that sort of stuff. So what's your duty of care to yeah. your informant? Now, so is your informant like undercover informant like or is just yeah a- she's an employee she's an she's a legitimate employee in the company right that, that we approach and she's slightly compromised for reasons i won't go into yeah so she's motivated to help us well i know i, I from the first of the series um there was a, a sort of a collaboration between you and the local state police guy you know like the young fella he was relatively speaking young not many there was no other police involved other than you and him um, it, was, it was fairly collaborative in this, I saw one of the trailers of uh, of the Force and Nature Dry Two. Um, it looks like it's a bit more conflict between you and the local police, the state police, between the AFP and the state police. It yeah, looks like it. I don't know what, yeah. what's going on. Well, it's it's their it's their turf, it's their search. You know, unlike in the Dry, you got to remember Aaron's in the town because he's gone home for a funeral. Yeah, like he's not there to work. He's it's a completely different. Um, scenario for him and then things happen and he gets kind of dragged into trying to work something out. In this case, it's just purely professional and it goes the other way and it's that professional involvement that makes it more personal for him in the end. So it's kind of almost the reverse of, of what we had in the dry in some ways. So is – and is Aaron – Aaron had a lot of personal reasons to get involved in the first of the series. Yeah, there was a lot of personal stuff. Yeah, um, particularly in relation to what happened when, when uh, uh, I think it was her name, Elise. Young Ellie. Ellie, yeah. that's it. Yeah. Ellie, Ellie, Ellie. Yeah. Well, she she drowned. But was, we, you know, I was hanging out to find out what the hell happened right to the end. Um, I got a bit nervous. I thought you're not going to tell me, and uh, I thought, oh my God, they're going to leave this open. I'm glad you took me to the final conclusion of it all, but. Um, what I didn't, I got a bit upset you didn't go and belt the old man, um, but uh, don't matter. There were notes for that. Yeah, like, no, that's I thought, the oh my American God, it's going to happen for sure. Because <laughs> I remember seeing, you know, you'd, you know, you were a bit roughed up and all that was on, but irrespective of that, um, this in Force of Nature, is Aaron the same personality, the same character? I mean, is that he, he's fairly um, staunch. Doesn't say much. He's not um, overly noisy, loud. He's not a like a funny character. He's yeah. pretty serious. Are you yeah. the same character? Yeah, he's he's probably. You can see a little bit of damage from our first storyline. It is standalone, so we didn't. We wanted to make sure that people who hadn't seen the dry can still just enjoy yep. this film as a standalone. Um, but you can see that that the work is taking its toll on him. And it's interesting, like I was, I was talking to um, some people and by the time a Fed gets to this age of like 50, mid-50s, like it's, that's, a, that's a, there's a massive pension waiting for him. Mm. Like it's a long time in the, in, in the, in the force, totally. you know. So it's quite, that's considered a very, very experienced seasoned. It's quite shocking for me to consider that, you know, I'm like, oh. Is that old? Is it like not old, but like it's it's a really senior. in the cops it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, he's 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 coming to grips with 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 all that for sure. So uh, is he looking at his own aging process and where he sits? Is he starting to question anything about himself? Oh, everything, absolutely everything. Yes, and Jacqueline McKenzie's character, he's he's his co-worker and kind of like his boss, does an amazing job of kind of being this hard ass, like this is what we do and we just this is how we go about our work and he's kind of a bit more kind of morally challenged by it all and I think questioning a lot of the tactics and a lot of the damage that's occurred as a result of, of that kind of policing. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's good for us because it gives us great material and Jane Harper's embedded a lot of that psychology Otherwise, it's just a cop trying to solve a crime, and that's boring. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. It's just you better have a really, really good crime to try and keep an audience with that, you know. Yeah, and I don't want to underplay something, and, you know, and forgive me if I'm um, sounding crude, but whodunits, it's not a thing that we see much of in Australia, like in terms of Australian movie scene. I can't really remember too many of them. Um, obviously, clearly it's great English drama. English, yeah. the, the Poms are great at this stuff. Yeah. Um, for, but it's more, this, I haven't seen the movie, I've only seen the trailer, but the previous movie I have seen, it's it's a lot more than just about a whodunit. So how would you best describe the genre of Force of Nature, for example? 
I describe it as a as a mystery thriller, really. And the audience, what's great about those films is the audience has a job to do, you know, and they can't help but to try and work out exactly what's going on. And it's it's slightly more engaging than a traditional drama in a way because in a drama you don't really have a job to do as an audience member other than just watch and observe and enjoy the performances and the story. But in a in a in a in this kind of who done it, it's you you can't relax into it in the same way. Our ego is such that you want to work out. You want to solve it. You want to solve it, you know, and and it's very engaging. It's very, very engaging. So I, I'm, I'm hoping they'll be as engaged with this as they were with the first one. Well, I mean, I, last, I mean I'd, I'd seen the drive, the first drive for a long time ago and I watched it again last night in, in anticipation of today. And uh, I have to say thanks very much because uh, you're right, I was engaged, got too engaged and um, – I watched it till about ten o'clock. I watched it to the end, ten o'clock last night, and I couldn't get to sleep to bloody midnight, which is the reason I'm feeling pretty ordinary this morning. I went, um, to, I had to go to jiu-jitsu this morning. I go to jiu-jitsu every Thursday morning, and I went to jiu-jitsu this morning, and I was crap. I got beaten up. <laughs> Sorry, and mate. it's only because I did get enough fucking sleep. <laughs> because, but, but it does. It caught I'll me. tell your competitors what to do next yeah, time. May watch recommend a, movie. a great movie the night before. <laughs> it was a great movie, and but it but it did engage me. You're right. I couldn't relax. I started thinking again. I started thinking more about it than I did on the first time. Probably because I was seeing you today, but 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 also like actually, I I thought deeper about the, the process of setting me up. I mean, obviously knew the right. outcome, but the setup. It's interesting when you watch it a second time, isn't yeah, it? Because yeah, then you get to see the structure. You get to and see. I did. It's really it's really interesting because that's how it is for us when we're editing a film, you know. So, yeah, it's it's an interesting perspective. And, and all the devices I thought you were using, I wouldn't know. But I mean, I just thought well, that's a device that sucked me in. That's a device that uh, made me think something that's uh, not the case. And you talk, you know, like the. <laughs> Gretchen walking out with a bag of, um, with a shotgun and the bag of, um, she had the blue casings, um, which yeah. is, was a sort of a, a really important. How good is she, before. by the way? Oh, How great, good is Genevieve O'Reilly, my God. great, fantastic. And I think the two of you worked well. And what was great is, uh, yeah, your chemistry, like on screen, yeah. it yeah. was brilliant, you know. And uh, yeah, but yeah, they talk about great actors. I mean, like. Uh, Matty Nabel, like how perfect was oh, he? Oh, mate, he's so good. That dumb drunk. Fighter in the bar. I mean, he's so good at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was so good to work with. Fantastic. Love yeah, that. He's, he, this show, it's the opposite in terms of cinematography. I don't mean in quality, but in terms of what you were filming. Yeah. You talked about filming a subtropical sort of rainforesty type thing. But there seems to be a lot of juxtaposition between, in the trailer that I saw, the city and the rainforest. Like, I mean, there's a lot of city scenes in the trailer I saw. Like, it looks like, I don't know if it's Melbourne or Sydney, I couldn't yeah. really tell, but a lot of tall buildings and then you'd flash over across to something completely the opposite. Yeah. Is there some sort of uh, some sort of play on here, like you trying to create something in our minds? Well, like it's what Jane Harper does so well. She she makes the landscape a central, a central character. So I guess juxtaposing um, big Australian city and also it's kind of fun to just present that kind of gritty urban image for overseas audiences as well, you know, because we don't see Australian cities that much in, in films. No. Not too much, you know. So it is it is deliberate. It also establishes, hey, he's from the city, you know, and out they go to try and solve this. And now we wanted the audience to feel the distance. We wanted them to feel as though the women really were in danger because, as you know, you don't have to go too far into the into a – threatening Australian landscape to be lost and need to know your stuff. Um, so we wanted to get get that sense of that. Are they staying at, are they camping or staying at a resort? What, what's the deal? The, the they're, they're basing themselves at a, at a, at a nice resort right. and, and they're heading off and then they've got to make certain campsites and spend some nights out there and and make certain checkpoints. Sort and of so challenges. Forth. Yeah, a little challenge, a little team building exercise. Yeah, 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 I'm sure yeah, you would yeah, have been yeah, involved yeah. in plenty of this. Well, we'll hopefully put them out of business, Mark, with this. I family. own a private resort. <laughs> I do exactly that stuff. And I'm thinking to myself, he stuffed it up because no one's ever going to want to go onto my private resort and go on one of these camps. No, I'm just joking. It'll work the opposite. You yeah. know it will. Yeah, totally. You know it'll be good for business. Don't, don't worry about it. I'll be putting this all over the website. No, I'm just joking. But, yeah, but yeah so I get it. So they, they're given challenges and, you, and a bit of bonding, you know, yeah. like how do I bomb this person? How do I, how do I relate Who's to going to be the map? Reader, who's in charge of directions, all that sort of stuff. Who's going to rise to the task? It's wonderful. It's great. And it's so well written in the book and we're really excited to adapt that because it's just very this very gradual disintegration of 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 the that kind of 
purposeful confidence of moving your way through the bush and then being slightly less confident and then being slightly less confident again and, and watching how the others respond. To, I, th I don't think we're going the right way anymore. I think we're in the shit. You know, no, but she's she's got the map. We've given her... We've given her the Sorry job. About that. <laughs> <laughs> he was a fucking best fit. It's my stupid brother, Adrian. Go, <laughs> my brother. So uh, say it again. I, that was yeah. so fucking good. This is, <laughs> now we're going to have to get back to your acting. So <laughs> okay. that part yeah. where the women are getting uh, disintegrating, are, are breaking down their character and starting to doubt themselves. Yeah, that part I'm really interested in because that that's just got me. Yeah, well, that's a bit that people can relate to. This idea that you'd move through the bush and you'd be full of confidence. And then someone's leading the way. They, they're, they're very confident in what they're doing. And then they get a bit further and they make a decision which track to go down. And they're slightly less confident, but we're still going to back this person because we've, we've chosen this person as our map reading person for this team building exercise. And the next junction comes and they take the next little fork in the road and the confidence dips slightly. About that the, person. The conviction in their voice. Yes, it's left. It's not right. You know. And then how does the group respond to that when they know they might be going the wrong way? And what are the ramifications of turning left instead of right? But we should be okay. We should, the map says this. And just Jane Harper has, has, has built that in so, so beautifully. And then how do, you, how, do, how do we respond in that situation? Who speaks up first? Who remains silent? Who just observes what the others in the group are doing? And that's, that's what's exciting for me when I read, when I read the book. And when we talked about adapting it, we thought the premise actually was kind of stronger than the dry. In a way, trying to explain or sell the dry as a, as a premise to an international audience is much harder. You know, it was easy once the film became a huge hit here. They all obviously, when the FOMO kicks in, they all have to see it. Yeah, it becomes see. a hit. But in some ways, Force of Nature is an easier sell because the basic premise of these five women going on a corporate retreat and getting lost in the bush, everyone just gets that straight away. I love it. Straight I actually away. love it, particularly five women and not five blokes. Yeah. Because, I mean, I'm actually really curious to see how five women interact. Why, why Force of Nature, by the way? You know, where does that fit into the whole thing? Why is it called Force of Nature? Uh, is there something that they're going to hit me on the chin with an uppercut and well, I'm going to say I'll get it? No, I guess it's just that acknowledging that, that, you know, nature has its is the force you know and doesn't matter what we do for, for for our line of work when you're in nature you're at nature's nature's beckoning like it's it, it that is the force you can't you can't really impose yourself on on nature and and what happens to these women is a direct result of you know nature taking its course i saw an interview with you um in talking and about australian films and you were very passionate about australian films which is which is great for us for us as Australians. In this particular film, in Force of Nature, how would you say it would have been made by, I don't know, Warner Brothers, one of the big Hollywood mm. producers relative compared to say how, how you and Rob Connolly produced it, what would the difference have been? Um, proud to say they couldn't have made it the way we made it. Um, there are mechanical logistical things that come with a big production that mean that there is no possible way they would have had access to the locations that we were in. So, Completely so impossible. In terms of authorization? In terms of, yes. So when you're going to get approval to get into some of these areas, the, the size of the, the unit, the, size, the how many people you have, how many trucks you have, how many trailers you have for actors, how big are the trailers, Where's the wardrobe? Like, how far from the unit base are the actors contractually allowed to travel? Um, we have to have a trailer that's no more than a five minute walk from the set. You know, no, no, we're hiking 45 minutes into the bush to get these shots. Oh, really? And we're carrying all the gear because there's no pathway to use trolleys and so forth. A, a large scale production just can't do that. And you're not, you're not getting the same people on board to be able to pull that off. They probably wouldn't have got permission to film where we filmed. You know, we have a local reputation. We, we, we're a stakeholder. We have a track record. Um, we're not just, we're not just choppering in with a clipboard and asking, can we just 
dump 200 people here and don't worry, we'll clean up afterwards. So um, there's a trust exercise there. So they just, the, the stuff that's on camera that would only be available to, to us and, and we as cast and crew have to make sacrifices to get into those locations, which we were all prepared to do. So it was made very, very clear when we assembled our crew in particular, this is where we're going. It's going to be really tough. There are no creature comforts. It's porta potties. It's sandwiches on your lap, um, and there's there's no comforts until the end of the day when you get back into your car. You're driving in in the dark, and you're driving out in the dark, and you're hiking in by torch, and you're coming out by torch. Wow. So, I I I've never been on a big <laughs> a big film where that where that happens. Um, a lot of the stuff would have been done on the sound stage. There's one 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 day where I turned up where we'd built this beautiful hut that looked like it'd been there for 50 years in the middle of the bush. And I thought, we really need to get out there that we're here because if this was an American film, this would be on a sound stage and the Greens department would have built this because it looks too bloody good. <laughs> like it looks fake. It looks like the denseness of the ferns and the overgrown nature of everything. It just, is it real? You know, so that works in our favour. So uh, I, if I was to ask you, just off the topic, or off the movie topic for a moment, what are your have have you got an iconic Australian movie with Australian actors filmed in Australia? So I guess there's no such thing as an Australian movie, an American movie, or an English movie. It's like, but something you see as a Australian. Do you have one that sort of sticks in your mind? Because I was thinking about it this morning myself. Mm. What sticks in my mind? And um, and I got a couple, but w w I would like what to. Do you mean from like you. my favourite Australian sort of favorite, film, or most iconic? Some, some of there won't be one. There'll be other. Be probably two or three for different mm. reasons. Yeah. But w what sort of comes to you? I think one of the most original, the most influential for me was the first Mad Max. Yeah, without a doubt. And and when you watch that film today, like every character in that film is so distinctive. Nuts. Those performances are nuts in that film. Like yeah. it's so out there, so yeah, out totally there. All out there. the all, every one of the bikers is different in the bikey gang. All the cops are different. Everyone is completely. You're different. talking about complexity, though, are you? Yeah, well, just the the, the colours of them and and yeah. and their, the the wardrobe choices, their performance choices. That they're, they're such crazy characters. The action is impeccable. The cinematography and tiny budget, tiny but I mean that film's amazing. Absolutely. And the second one, I think, is just a complete work of art. Second Mad Max yeah. is just, you know, to go from that low, you know, small scale to a, to a larger budget, but not not have it be worse, have it be just as good, if not better. I mean, we've got some amazing Australian Australian films, but that's, you know, in terms of the old ones, that's the one that jumps out for me. I was thinking about this, this morning myself, and I thought of Gallipoli. Yeah. I, I thought that was, and of course, the two characters in the Gallipoli, one of which never survived, for some reason... He didn't, he's dead now. But like for some reason, that sticks in my mind. Is, I don't know whether it's because of Anzac Day or not. I don't know. But there's something very Australian about the whole stitch up Australians going to war and being sent yeah, to right. the front line. And I just saw something, uh, I, maybe I'm going to get cancelled for saying this about war, etc. <laughs> you know, Anzac Day, etc. Perhaps. But I thought it was very, a really well made movie. Break Ram Morant's another one. Yeah, especially when it represents the South Australian Film Corporation, whatever they call them. So they first started getting up and uh, funding films. Mm -hmm. I thought that was pretty cool yep. to get Australian films funded from Australian organisations and not not really for profit type organisations. Yep. Um, how important going forward is Eric Benner becoming like a ambassador for producing Australian films? Not others coming from overseas to produce films. See, I don't mean that. Mm. That's great. It's fantastic for our whole industry, but yep. for Australians to do what you're doing. Yeah, it's a real balance. It really is. I think our industry is really strong. We have amazing crews, but that's not enough because there are amazing crews everywhere around the world. So what's your point of difference? You know, is it just a tax credit? Is it your locations? Is it how people feel when they come here that they want to come back? Um, but for the Australian industry, um, it's a really tough balance because we're competing for crews against big, large budget shows. We're asking crews that have offered five months secure work to come and freeze our asses off for seven weeks. As in, to do as, it. in as in the force of nature. Yeah. 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 And 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 you're appealing to their good nature or their sense of art 
or their film legacy to go, yeah, I'll make that choice. I'll come and work on that. I want to I want to have my name on that film rather than that show or that TV series or that big scale American production where I might not even get to know the filmmakers. Um, so it is, it is a tough balance, but at the same time, it's important. I want Australian crews to, to have those jobs and to have work year round. Um, but it can't come at the expense of Australian films not being able to get access to things, you know. So I don't have the solutions there for smarter people like yourself, Mark. Um, but it is it is it is a tough a tough balance, um, and we just have to keep working really hard to make the best films that we can. Hope that they travel. It's great when they travel. It's great when we get sales overseas. And people see us as equal in filmmaking, and they hear our own accents and they see australia how it really is i think that's really important you know and i'm i'm proud to be a part of that and and um i don't do it just for the sake of it i only want to do it when i think something can be really really good um but it's it's exciting it's it's very satisfying when you travel overseas and someone says i saw the dry you know it's, it's an australian film that they're talking about not one of one of your other films um that's a really good feeling so the the Force Nation is going to be released in Australia on the eighth of February. Yes, is that right? Yeah. Does it get released overseas as well? Yes. Yeah, and we have the same day. a lot of, not in the same day. We have a lot of overseas sales. We'll, we've got a great exhibitor in distributor in America who who launched the the dry over there. IFC they've got Force of Nature as well. We're in talks with them that'll be released in America this year. Um, so we'll we'll do our best to get get this film in front of big American audience as well. I mean, you should get uh, come, come along to Vegas when the um, NRL is playing two games in Vegas. They're launching the NRL season in Las Vegas in the beginning of March. Perfect timing. Eric Ben is here, man. I'll get your Roosters cap. You can because I'm on the board. Of Roosters. I don't, have, I don't have an NRL team, mate. mate get the Roosters, you know, because uh, you know the South Sydney. Of course, I've got Russell Crowe and uh, various other people. Um, Do you have an AFL team? Me, Collingwood. Yeah. Sorry. I know, I know, I know, I know, but it doesn't matter. Only because I'm made of Eddie's and I've been mates with Eddie's for years. And I was a sponsor of Collingwood for many years, My one of my companies. Sponsor. But, but for you, I'm happy to make changes. So oh. you're St. You're, Kilda. St. Kilda, yeah. Mark. I know, I know, but everyone hates Collingwood unless they're both. Do you know what? I decided after 2010 for my mental health that I couldn't hate Collingwood. But it's just too much. It's just too much. So I don't actually hate them anymore. I, I have I have a, um, a soft respect for them, and I love our rivalry. Um, and yeah, Eddie did an amazing job for the club. Um, we'll get there. My boys will get there. I've never seen us win a flag. I've been to every final since oh, I was no. born, um, and I love my club so much. Um, so if you ask me what character do I want to play, I want to play the the the. the <laughs> The film version of St Kilda winning the I'll be Ross Lyon in 2024, <laughs> 2025 in the grand final premiership winning <laughs> team. There's a character. The problem is this. In AFL particularly, there seems to be so many well-known personalities in Australia who have a team. Yeah. You know, like Mick Malloy, for example. Like, like Tigers. T t my God, like t talk about like a Tiger fanatic. But there's so many big personalities have um, their team sort of tattooed across their forehead that – it's going to be very hard for you, for me, and or for me to actually go across to say someone like uh, being a, a friend of St Kilda. And it's going to be very hard for you to become a friend of Collingwood. But what I would extend to you is to become a friend of the Sydney Roosters, mate, because we hate South. You know, and we don't hate Russell Crowe. Although when Russell, I was at the game when Russell Crowe, when South scored a try against us, and Russell Crowe looked across at our chairman Nick Politis, and he went like this, and Gladiator just finished. Right. And just come on the screen. And, of course, uh, they do that in the Gladiator until Russell Crowe like I've got to go for the Roosters. Hell. Absolutely. We would absolutely welcome. And, and you know, for that matter, we'd love to host you in Las Vegas to watch our game up there. <laughs> we, we actually are going to Las Vegas in the beginning of March to open the season up. It's going to be the first time uh, there's been a rugby league match there. Oh, wow. And we're going to be playing at the stadium where the Super Bowl final will be played as well. Wow. Um, in Vegas. And uh, and it's, it's a big deal. And... Australians. Is it for points or is it exhibition? Exhibition. So, the, and and uh, play, uh, Australians are well represented in the states, largely through our actors. Largely through our actors. I mean, sure, some businessmen sort of kick a few goals there, but generally speaking, it's largely through our, our acting, your acting community, and uh, you know, Australia Day is coming up, and I know I don't want to get into politically sensitive areas, but 
generally speaking, Australia Day is a big day in, in Los Angeles for Australian actors. They get together and they have a big deal. Are you part of the Australian contingent that always stays in touch with each other in the US? Not really, no, because I've lived here my whole life. Um, and so, yes, I do have I do have a few friends who are who are actors who are based overseas, but I've never really been part of that group because I'm always I'm always here, you know. And when I'm there, I'm just working my butt off for a week or two, and then I'm on the plane, I'm out. So, yeah, I'm a bit disconnected from that kind of that kind of scene or that kind of kind of group. Um, but that's okay. Yeah, it's a different thing for me over here. And so is who? Final question to you. Yeah. Who's Eric Benner when he's not on a film set? In Australia, or wherever, for that matter. What's he do during that? Like, is he father, <laughs> husband, obviously, kids? What, what are you doing? What do you do? Like, how, how's your life run? Um, I'd almost call myself a full-time motorcyclist. That's embarrassing. Um, uh, I like my downtime, mate. I'm probably very different to a lot of the guests that you, you have on. Um, I really, like, time is, I feel like, the biggest flex like just the, the, the biggest thing. Um, so love playing golf, love cycling, love being on my motorbikes. Um, I just, yeah, love going to the footy every week, love going to watch them train, um, hanging out with my friends and family. Yeah, take my parenting really seriously. Um, yeah, I, lo I love my life here. I wouldn't, wouldn't swap it for anything at all, anything at all. So, yeah, the cars, the bikes are a big, big part of my life and the footy and all the good, all the good things. And will you watch the movie when it comes out on the screen for everybody else to watch? Will you actually well, it's go tough and... because I'm, as a producer, I've seen it a yeah. hundred times in the air and so forth. I probably won't sit down and watch it with a, with an audience. I always regret when I don't do that. But um, also, I know this sounds really bizarre. It's kind of not really my business how the audience responds. That's that's for them. You know, I've done my job. I hope the film does well. I hope every film does well. But um, I, I have a theory that you make a film, you watch it once, you know, if, if you're not a producer, you, you watch it that first time and you remember everything about making the film. Like you remember everything. It's like when a tennis player recounts a big match. Yeah, I was 4-3 down against Sampras and it was, you know, love 30 and it was my second serve and I went to the base. You know, how do you remember that? Well, that's for us when you watch a film, you just remember everything. So I remember when I'm making a film, that experience is really important. How I feel about the finished product, myself, really important. And then I put that in a box, mate, and I close it and it's impenetrable, impenetrable. And that's what keeps me going. You, you, you can't be affected by the response to things, whether it's big, whether it's small, you cannot let that penetrate the creative process and the decision-making process. So I, I kind of feel almost like that's their space in the cinema and doesn't, that doesn't belong to me. That's, that's there. That's for them. So I probably won't sit down and watch it with an audience. Um, we do a lot of Q&A screenings and so forth, so I get a bit of a vibe how it's going from that. But, yeah, it's largely out of your control and it's yeah, on, on to the next thing. Well, mate, just some – opportunity to talk to you and haven't watched the first of the series and, and watch a lot of your movies. Um, Force of Nature is well named because uh, I reckon it's going to be Force of Nature. I think this one's going to kill it. Oh, I hope so. I really do. I mean, it's got a lot, it's going to have a lot of momentum behind it once you finish up, finish your talks. But my gut feeling, and like I'm no movie expert, but my gut feeling on this is the right time for Australians to have a movie like this. It's the right time for Australians. Everybody I talk to, I told that I'm going to have you on the show today, and maybe it's just because I'm talking to people like-minded of myself. Oh, wow, Eric Banner. People love you. They're going to love you in this role. I, They loved you in the previous role of, of The Dry. I think this is going to kill it. And I would say to anybody who doesn't watch it, you're going to miss out. So believe me, FOMO is going to be a big deal. Good. Eric Banner, thanks Good. very much, mate. Thanks, Mark. Great to be here. Thanks for having me.